Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The big news from NASA this week was the announcement of the winners for their contracts for spacesuit services in the coming decade or so. NASA uh, needs new spacesuits. The EMUs that they have, the extravehicular mobility units, are very, very old. They were developed for the Space Shuttle program. They transitioned into the International Space Station program. And yeah, you know, some of the hardware in those are not available anymore. I'm not sure what exact things, but I do know, for example, that uh, the charging unit that is used on the International Space Station runs on a 6502 processor. And while you can get like 100 megahertz modern 6502 clones, that's probably not going to pass muster in a life or death environment. You're going to want an exact pin and power compatible version, which could mean finding a classic piece of computer hardware and breaking it apart so you can get those processors. Anyway, look, uh, they've been trying to replace these for a long time. The XEMU program started during the Constellation era, and that was the one that you saw at this big presentation in 2019 with this you know, wonderfully happy engineer inside that suit showing it off. And, and I felt so much joy for that individual showing off all our hard work and walking around in this monster spacesuit. But unfortunately, that program didn't move fast enough and it was really going to be delivering the hardware way after it was needed. The original plan or the plan was, you know, 2024, people walking on the moon. Guess what? The spacesuit wasn't going to be able to do it. Sure, SLS isn't going to be able to do it, but, you know, spacesuit wasn't going to be able to do it either. And so about a year ago, NASA switched change tax, right? They basically said, instead of buying spacesuits for EVAs, we are going to be renting them. We're going to have industry suppliers who are going to build their own suit designs, and we'll pay them to train the astronauts, provide the suits with all the necessary capabilities. And, uh, you know, it's just going to be like paying SpaceX to fly astronauts on Dragon. Now, you might think that's a little odd because, hey, this is a suit. You know, do you rent a suit? Well, yes, actually, people do rent suits for weddings. But, you know, renting a spacesuit, if you think about it, a spacesuit is basically just a very small spacecraft. It's just one that is conformal to the shape of the user and a little more articulated than, say, the Dragon. Uh, however, the cost is actually right up there with spacesuits, uh, with spaceships, right? The HLS, the human landing system contract that SpaceX is being paid to put a starship on the surface of the moon to demonstrate their capabilities, that is like $2.9 billion. This spacesuit contract for the next decade or so is going to be $3.5 billion, which is just, frankly, it's wacky and wild. I don't know how this is going to work out, but it sounds like they're going to be paying tens of millions of dollars for every suit for every spacewalk. Anyway, um, the winners, the winners that were announced was uh, Axiom and Collins Aerospace. Now, these guys have partners that are working in. Uh, the contract, by the way, is called the Exploration Extravehicular Activities Services, so XEVAS, right? So Axiom is partnering with Dave Clark, uh, KBR and Paragon Space Development Corporation. Collins Aerospace, they are partnered with ILC Dover and Oceaneering. Now, Dave Clark and ILC Dover, those two, of course, were the two contractors behind the Apollo spacesuit. So they have, you know, they have in-house experience on building EVA suits for the surface of planets. Uh, and Collins, by the way, I don't know, that name doesn't come up very often, but they are uh, they used to be like a radio manufacturer. They were acquired, acquired by Rockwell, you know, to do avionics, spun off into Rockwell. Collins, acquired by United Technology, then acquired by Raytheon. So technically, they're a subsidiary of Raytheon. And since we all know that Raytheon loved to make laser weapons for the Department of Defense, we can assume that we're going to get laser-armed spacesuits like Moonraker out of this, right? Right? So yeah, this is a three, potentially a $3.5 billion contract. The exact costs are all hidden, and it could be that it's way below that. It could be that they've padded the numbers. It could be, I, I don't think it's going to go over this, because this is supposed to be like a fixed price style of contract rather than a cost plus. And the other thing is, because it's being outsourced, when the spacesuits inevitably end up delayed, NASA can point the finger and say, it's not us, it's these contractors that are being useless. 
I mean, of course, NASA was being pretty useless with its EMU. Um, yeah, I mean, 3.5 billion, like, to put it in comparison, I believe the Chinese EVA suit, the Phytan, is about $5 million each. Now, obviously, they have to add further costs for consumables and maintenance and stuff like that, but that's all pretty cheap, right? Uh, yeah. So anyway, the announcement was made. We had a whole lot of you know, press releases and a lot of talk about plans, and we didn't actually see any pictures of the spacesuits until uh, later. Collins Aerospace did release a couple of images showing their development spacesuits. Uh, one, one of them, by the way, it makes it fairly clear that the pack on the back is like a backpack. It's not like the XEMU, which had a door on the back. That's called a suit port. The idea is you open up the suit on the back, you climb in through the back, it's nice and easy, put your hands in and then close that up and button yourself up. That's how the Orlan and Phyton work. It is a well-tested uh, capability and, and certainly seems to be a, a good idea. That doesn't look like what uh, Collins is coming up with. We don't know what Axiom are doing. The only image we have from Axiom is a publicity photo they released on Twitter a while back saying there's a new suit designer in town. Uh, it was very dark. You can Photoshop it to see a few more details, but frankly, it's not really clear what they're doing, but it could well be just that they're taking a derivative of the XEMU. And since we're talking about space, everyone's going to be saying, hey, what about SpaceX? They have spacesuits. Yes, they do. They are developing their own EVA suit for the Polaris Dawn mission, which, you know, Jared is going to go spacewalking in. But right now, it's not clear how articulated this will be, how capable it will be for actual, you know, working in an EVA environment where you need to manipulate tools and maneuver. He wants to, he's a sightseer, right? He's a tourist. I mean, he, okay, he's a private spaceflight participant who is very clearly an amazing individual, but I'm still going to use the word tourist because it doesn't matter if he can't hold tools properly because the spacecraft isn't going to fail. So he's probably, it's going to have limited mobility. Uh, he'll float around. He's not going to need to do a lot of work. So the joint mobility doesn't need to be a, a big thing. Um, there is, however, I will point out an on-ramp clause in the the program, which allows for other qualifying providers to come on at a later date, providing they have product which satisfies NASA's requirements. And, you know, if you look at uh, Na uh, SpaceX's, you know, promotional video, you know, animations showing their plans to land on the moon and Mars and things like that, they have people around in spacesuits. Maybe space, SpaceX does have some internal suit development thing which will satisfy NASA. Who knows? Uh, the only There are requirements for these suits. First of all, they're going to be able to have to do all the stuff on the space station that's required. And that'll probably be the first place where we actually see them being tested. There's no guarantee that the suits that are used for the space station will be built by the same people as the suits that go to the surface of the moon. For the lunar surface excursions, they are requiring two suits that are able to do five EVAs over six days. So, you know, that... They're going to need to be able to be turned around relatively quickly. But yeah, what happened to the EXEMU? So there's been a couple of reports from the Office Inspector General. There was one in 2017, which at that point they had spent nine years working on it and $200 million and were no, not ready to make their suit. In 2021, there was another suit. Four years later, $220 million, total of $420 million smoked. And yeah. Uh, nothing. So the, the report projected that they would need a total of $1 billion and maybe might be ready in 2025. Now, some people think that there were just too many partners involved in this. They had everyone that had any experience in, in spacesuits involved in the XEMU project. Like there's this little slide that shows all the contractors. It's, it's like a perfect example of zip code contracting where you're trying to get all your uh, politicians on board. 27 different contractors. There were two different contractors working on boots, right? And the other option, so that might have contributed because you've got all these different competing interests trying to agree and that slows things down because you have to have agreements made between groups that may not even be in the same part of the country. Another possibility that might have contributed to slow development would be that the XEMU 
wanted to do everything. It wanted to work on orbit and work on the surface of the moon. And it wanted to be easy to enter and have lots of mobility. And maybe they were being too general, right? If you can build an orbital suit, only suit, then it means you can limit the mobility of the legs, right? It means you can save a lot of mass. You can focus on the things that will work on orbit. The, then you can have a different suit, which is maybe more expensive, more complex, and that is designed for working on the lunar surface. You know, right? There are possibilities that might have contributed to making things you know, hard. Uh, but yeah, the XEMU program will continue, it'll meet its goals, and then it'll basically be wound down, subject to like a program, technical review, and the data will be shared with all of our interested partners, and including specific designs if they are so interested. Now, the other spacesuit from that 2019 presentation was, of course, the new version of the orange pumpkin suit that we see from the space shuttle, right? So in the space shuttle of on ascent, they would have on the later years they would have the aces, the advanced crew entry or escape or entry suit, and you know that was that was just a very simple pressure suit that would keep people alive if there was an emergency that return needed them to return to the Earth. And over the last few years, this has been modified into the Orion crew survival suit. It's the same glorious orange color. Uh, it was, again, it was shown off at that event. It's different though. It's required to support astronauts for like six days wearing the pressure suit. So if there's a hole in the cabin that cannot be replaced and they're on a trip around the moon, they can't just turn around and come home. They have to go where gravity tells them. So they have to be able to support them for like a long time. That means it includes like a, a urine collection system so that they can, you know, eject that stuff overboard. It includes like a port in the helmet where they can stick a straw so that they can drink uh, meals and things like that. Um, the gloves are touchscreen compatible since back in the space shuttle era, who'd ever heard of a touchscreen, right? It was They were only coming in towards the end. Um, on the other hand, they've simplified a number of things. The Orion crew suits are individually tailored to the individual astronauts. Whereas since they had a lot of different people running through the space shuttle program, they were they would have their torso adjusted by a series of pulleys and, and latches and things like that. So they were much more diverse. So by focusing on specific individuals, they uh, simplify the designs. So that, I believe, is still what is going to be used for like Artemis II and, and going forwards. Uh, there was an interesting other variant, by the way, of the ACES, which was investigated. You know, so these suits are not designed to go outside. They're designed for living in the cabin during an emergency. But back uh, when they were looking at the er one of the early Artemis flights being the asteroid redirect mission, where the crew would go up in an Orion capsule next to an asteroid which had been put into lunar orbit or near lunar orbit by a spacecraft, and they would investigate that. Uh, they were investigating something called MACES, the Modified Advanced Crew uh, Escape Suit. See, the thing is, if you're going to go on an EVA, you, you're supposed to have the EMU, but the EMU has a hard torso, and it's heavy. It's not something you can wear during launch and landing. So you would need to have the ACES suit, right, for, for that, and then you would need to have an EVA suit so you could actually go out and do the work on the asteroid. And those are big, they take a lot of space and that they add mass, so they thought maybe there's a way we can make these nice orange IVA suits work for an EVA. So that's what they did, the modified ACES, and they actually went and they, uh, took, they put better gloves on them so that they could actually do the manipulation. They put better boots so that they could latch into things like uh, you know uh, platforms. And uh, they changed the life support system, which is also a true in the Orion crew support system. The, the new suits have uh, a fully, like a closed cycle life support. The old ACES suits, they would you would have the air would go in and then it would just leak out at the same rate as it was going in. So they would maintain pressure, but they would be constantly blowing the gas out. So it had a very limited lifespan. The new suits take the air in and then they have a, an air return, which 
which uh, processes the air and sends it back. So that means that they can actually survive for, for six days as opposed to a couple of hours. So yeah, this uh, modified ACES suit, they actually did testing in the neutral buoyancy lab. You know, there's these photos of the guys in the orange suit actually attempting to, you know, investigate whether they could do space walks with, uh, you know, hardware in this suit that was really not well designed for it because it didn't have the same level of mobility. I'm not sure how far that got, but I mean, it's clear that they changed tacks to work with the Orion crew survival suit, which is you know, better and more appropriate. It's a, a little more modern design in many ways. So I think those orange suit that was shown off, that is still the plan for Artemis II. And there is one other sort of interesting angle of this because the if you right so these suits these IVA suits they tend to get paired with the spacecraft right because they have to plug into the life support on that spacecraft and so they're they're designed in that way now if we see Artemis 3 doing a lunar landing then you're going to have the crew launching on an Orion spacecraft wearing uh, the Orion crew suits they're going to need the whatever EVA suit, either the Collins or the Axiom suit for EVA on the surface of the moon. But for landing in the Starship, they're going to have a SpaceX suit because it's going to be paired with the Starship. And that probably would be like a Dragon style IVA suit simply because SpaceX is very likely using the same life support technology that it's already tested on Dragon. So you're going to have three different spacesuits, and two of those are going to be ha tailored to the astronauts. Both the SpaceX and the uh, Orion suit are tailored exactly to the astronauts. So yes, the clock is ticking. Axiom and Collins have a few years to get their suits ready for lunar operations and for ISS operations because relying on those old EMUs are not, uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. An interesting thing from Axiom's point of view, by the way, is since they're wanting to do the private space station thing and it will be on orbit by the time their suits are ready, they actually said that they have private individuals who are interested in testing them. It's entirely possible that some of the first on orbit uses of their spacesuits could actually be private citizens that are paying to fly to space. Uh, I also think that they might be more focused on the orbital suit capabilities since they have the station, whereas Collins might decide to focus on the lunar surface capabilities. And that's what their suit is more in line with because we've seen the, the articulation in those legs, whereas we've only seen the Axiom suit from the, you know, the shoulders up. Uh, whatever, I hope that over the next few you know, days, months, weeks, we find out more about the, their suit designs, their options, and you know, who else was rejected, who didn't make the cut and why. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.